uh, and we'll probably see uh, a wave of investment demand that will push the silver price higher. Let's talk about your uh, your data collection methodology and the components of your supply and demand uh, market balance chart here. Uh, you know, I, I had the Silver Institute on not too long ago. I also had Keith Newmeyer on uh, shortly after that, and he challenged a lot of their data. One of Keith's concern, Keith, of course, for the viewers, is the CEO of First Majestic Silver. One of Keith's concern was that their data methodolo collection methodology was inaccurate. In fact, he challenged whether or not, for example, they, they put recycling into their supply, and he challenged whether or not recycling can even be gathered as a data entry because much of that information is private um, and not disclosed to the public. Uh, so, can we? Can you walk through some of the um, some of the components of your of your of your of your chart? Uh, for example, look, the, the Silver Institute was very transparent in breaking it down. On the demand, for example, they have industrial demand, jewelry, photography is a separate line item. What's in yours, and how do you gather this data? We have, and and I've given you charts on my supply, secondary sure. recovery, and and the demand. We gather data, and again, you have to understand, I've been doing this since the 1970s. Uh, I, I took over the J. Aaron Research Department in 1980. We were producing the book on silver, uh, and we still are. So we're sort of a big source. We left Goldman, J. Aaron was bought by Goldman in 81. We left in 1986 and stood up as an independent research company. And I'll tell you, when we left, we thought, what if no one wants to talk to us when we're no longer part of Goldman Sachs. And what we found was everyone wanted to talk even more to us once we were no longer part of Goldman Sachs because we were fully independent and they were buying intelligence from us. They're not buying, you know, people don't pay CPN Group to be bullish. People pay CPN Group to tell them this is what's going on in the silver market. So what we do is we provide, we create research. And in precious metals and in specialty metals like manganese and vanadium and, and lithium and cobalt, you don't have a lot of data on fabrication demand. You don't have any data on fabrication demand or on secondary supply. And that's actually true with base metals too, to a uh, extent, but less so. But we came out of J. Aaron, Goldman Sachs, doing precious metals, which are extremely secretive markets. They're not secretive because of conspiracies. They're secret because they can be. And investors and other people around the world want to be secret. Now, if you look at the methodology, mine production is relatively easy because mining companies often are public companies, more often than not are public companies. They have regulatory requirements to file information on their properties and their operations. And they also have an economic incentive because they're trying to stimulate investment demand in their shares. Secondary supply is primarily done by private companies that are extremely secretive and extremely competitive one against the other. And fabrication demand is done by a range of companies, many of whom are actually private or small uh, public corporations and a few large corporations. Uh, and those entities have no legal or regulatory requirement to report how much raw materials they're hedging and pricing strategies. Uh, and then we also work on, uh, we work with fabricators on that. And then we also work with investors advising them on what we see going on in the market. And, you know, we've been involved with many of the major investors in silver since 1979 with the Hunt brothers. Uh, we were friends with them before I even went to J. Aaron. Uh, and, and so what we do is we work with these people. Now that does several things. A is if they want good advice from us, they have to give us good information about what their exposure to silver really is. Right. The second thing is it gives us an understanding of how this how the metal moves through the market that you just can't get if you're a desk analyst who's not involved in financial transactions. And so that gives us a superior flow of information, which helps our research and analysis. We're very careful to never divulge confidentialities or blow them. And we've worked with you know, major corporations, major governments, major investors, and we've never really blown that confidentiality. But being involved with them as advisors gives us insights into the market that you simply can't get as a desk analyst. Okay, so 
you let's take a look at this fabrication demand chart uh it says fabrication demand is not rising and you break it down by components photography jewelry electronics semiconductors um and so on and so forth so it's not rising let's take a look at the supply side now you have two charts showing mine supply the first one that says mine production declined since 2015 in perspective and the second one that says plenty of silver left to mine. um you know i've been hearing this narrative from miners that indeed the reserves are depleting is that is that uh, something that's reflected in these charts here? Well, no, because reserves are reserves are depleting at existing operating mines. They're not depleting on an annual basis. So if you look at our first chart, and that goes back to something that you mentioned about Keith Newmeyer, we have mine production, and you can see that yes, mine production fell over the last four years. It reached a record high in 2015, I believe. Uh, fell for four years, and then we expected to rise. And we also have secondary recovery. And again, you know, Keith is right. This is extremely secretive. These guys, you know, you can't just call them up and say, hi, I'm, I'm Jack Smith from such and such a company, and I'm doing research on silver. How much silver do you recover from scrap? They won't tell you, or they'll tell you something else. You know, uh, but CPM Group has good relations with refiners halfway, or, uh, all the way around the world. Uh, and, and so we think that we have a better flow of information there. The second chart, which is actually silver mineable reserves and the resource base, which is sort of a subset of resources. And we don't have resource data, unfortunately, because it, it, it doesn't exist. But that's very telling. It goes back to 1956. And you can see in 1950s, uh, the, this is U.S. Bureau of Mines data, U.S. Geological Survey data. Now, in the 1950s, the, they thought there was about 5 billion ounces of silver in reserves in the world. Resources are much larger. Resources include mineralized deposits that are not necessarily economically mineable at current prices, but might become if the price rises. And that's very important, because if you look at this, you can see from 1956 to present, you've seen a sharp increase to about, well, it got as high as 18 billion ounces, and now it's around 16 billion ounces of reserves. Over that period of time, there have been people consistently saying, we're running out of silver. We don't find, we're not finding reserves. Uh -huh. And you've mined 31 billion ounces of silver over that 66 year period. Yeah. And you've never had 31 billion ounces of reserve. So when a miner says my reserves are, are, are being depleted, they're talking about their mines that are in operation. And they're not necessarily talking about global reserves, and they're not talking about global resources. Global resources are estimated to be more than 10 times what reserves are. Uh, but they are much more squishy numbers because of the nature of resources compared to reserves. Reserves are more drilled out, proven and probable reserves, whereas resources tend to be either uh, drilled out to some extent or inferred or in indicated, which is drilled out to some extent, or inferred. Uh, so it's a much more spongy number. Sure. But the reality is the world has plenty of silver, both in the ground and above ground, at higher prices, you will see mine production rise. You know, if you go back to 1979, 1980, when the hunts were buying their silver, and I was getting involved in this market, there were any number of people who were saying the world's running out of silver, and the price has to go to $100. Hecla, uh, run by radically different management than currently, uh, was on the bridge of bankruptcy uh, when the price of silver was $5 an ounce. But when the price of silver rose to $50 and then came down to 16 and was trading around seven or eight dollars, Hecla paid off its debt in a record period of time. Okay, Jeff. Let's so finally let's put all this together. Now you've you've given your bullish outlook on silver. How much higher can we rise now that we're in, according to your analysis, a surplus and that should drive the bull rally higher? What is your price outlook for the end of the year and into next year? <laughs> we think that the price is going to tread water right now. I wouldn't be surprised to see you know strength in the end of the year, and I wouldn't be surprised to see the price somewhere between say 27 and 31, 32 dollars, uh, with an average price probably just a little bit below uh, 30 dollars for the fourth quarter. 
Next year, we see the price moving modestly higher. And then beyond that, we expect another global financial crisis, another recession, uh, a lot of the economic and financial problems that are, and political problems yeah. that we face today will be three years worse. Uh, and we'll probably see uh, a wave of investment demand that will push the silver price higher. We're not looking for $100 silver, much less $1,500 or $13,000, uh, but we do see the price able to go to record prices on a spike much higher and on an annual average basis, uh, probably north of $50. We, you know, this, this, we can, we can save this uh, for another time and dive into more detail. But we, we, why didn't we see this spike above fifty dollars last year? Gold hit its all-time highs. Why didn't silver? Because there's a lot of silver around, and and gold, gold is more universally seen as a financial asset and a safe haven asset. So when we got into the pandemic and the economic lockdown and the recession, there were more people moving toward gold then we're moving towards silver. And the gold market is much more resilient. As I said earlier, if you look at bull and bear markets, in the gold market, in a bear market, investors tend not to sell their gold, they buy less gold. Investors hold on to their gold much more readily. In the silver market, investors are much more willing to buy and sell silver. So you have long periods of time when they're net sellers, and you have large periods of time when there is enormous growth sales. Mm -hmm. In 1997, when Berkshire Hathaway was buying 127 million ounces of silver, we have like a, a, a 150 million ounce deficit. So investors were selling 300 million ounces of silver that year, even as he was buying all of that stuff. Okay. And you saw that last year too. There were any number of investors who said, oh man, I've been holding this stuff at $14 an ounce because it was 50 and somebody told me it was going to go to 100 any day. I can get $30. Take it, please. Sure. And that put a cap on silver prices last year. Jeff, I want to thank you so much for coming in today. You were very generous with your time and uh, your research. We'll talk more about your analysis next time. Thank you. Okay, thanks.